Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we're going to be exploring the fascinating topic of spirit materialization. My guest, Leslie Kane, is an investigative journalist. She is also the granddaughter of Robert Kane, who served 10 terms as a Republican congressman from New Jersey. Her early work as an investigative journalist led her to be co-author of books such as Burma's Revolution of the Spirit, The Struggle for Democratic Freedom and Dignity, and also Henry Hyde's Moral Universe, where more than time and space are warped. After that, she ventured into the field of ufology, writing UFOs, Generals, pilots, and government officials go on the record. And most recently, Surviving Death, a journalist investigates evidence for an afterlife. This is an internet interview, and I'll switch now over to the internet video. Welcome, Leslie. It's a pleasure to see you. It's so great to be here, Jeff. Thanks for having me. We're going to be talking about one of the most controversial and I think exciting phenomena that has ever been reported in the field of psychical research, spirit materializations. Uh, And the irony is it's been reported over and over and over again for 150 years and almost invariably people just refuse to digest it or accept it, except for a tiny handful of of people who are the eyewitnesses. Yeah, that's true, Jeff. I don't think most people even know the extent to which it's been scientifically documented under controlled conditions. And maybe if they did, but even so, I think there's a a, a boggle factor of just, it's so hard to accept that this could happen. It's so impossible that it's just off of off the table for most people. And when you've experienced it, that changes things. But very few people ever have the opportunity of experiencing it. I know that uh, even amongst parapsychologists, there's kind of an attitude that these reports go back to the 19th century or early 20th century and uh, those people must have been deluded or something because we can't replicate it in an experimental laboratory over and over again the way we apparently can do with card guessing experiments or remote viewing experiments. And therefore, if it can't be uh, replicated repeatedly in the laboratory and reproduced independently by skeptical experimenters, it doesn't exist. I know. Well, Jeff, as you know, as well as I, there are so many phenomena in the paranormal world that can't be reproduced in a laboratory. And um, the thing about physical mediumship is, number one, it's very rare. There are very few people that even have the ability. But And number two, everything depends on what they call energy. Everything depends on who is present in the room, what the circumstances are, the connection between the medium and the sitters. You know, and so bringing it in, bringing somebody into a laboratory and getting predictable results is difficult, but it has been done actually. Uh, Eusebia Palladino, a very famous uh, physical medium, and Franek Kluski, another f- physical medium from Poland, both of these people were studied in the lab. And I don't think there's any reason not to respect the ability of scientists at that time to do as thorough a job as they could do now. And they did a meticulous job in those days with these, particularly with these two physical mediums, and it's all documented. And not to mention Dee Dee Holm, and uh, or Hume, I believe is the correct pronunciation, and uh, 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 Minna Crandon uh, in the early twentieth century, who nearly uh, received an award from Scientific American for demonstrating it in front of a scientific committee before uh, the famous ma- magician Houdini stepped in. But I think another factor to consider is that. When people make the claim that they can produce large-scale macro 
phenomena of this sort, they're almost invariably subjected to attack. And by and large, their lives are made miserable simply because they make the claim. I guess so. It just seems to be the hardest thing for people to deal with. And for me personally, to me, it is the most interesting aspect of the paranormal. That the I've studied a lot of the different aspects of it. And the one that excites me and interests me the most is physical mediumship, which is basically PK occurring to the extent that it even creates living forms and living beings. I find it so utterly astonishing and mysterious and so hard to explain that uh, there's nothing that that fascinates me more and I think for me the more it the more that way it is the more I'm drawn to it whereas for the more materialistically oriented you know straight-laced scientists that you're talking about it's the opposite the more it is that way the more they want to get away from it and I don't understand where the curiosity is to, to explore the, the most extraordinary, to me, the most extraordinary phenomena that are happening on the planet happen in this small room in England that for, for eight people a week. And it goes on and on and on year after year. And, you know, there it is. So there's a whole lot of factors, I think, that go into why it's, it's, it's not interesting to people. We've talked on some of, about some of them, but I'm only, I'm just astonished by that and I'm utterly fascinated by it. I think a lot of people are afraid very simply that if it appears to their colleagues that they endorse this kind of a phenomenon, if they're not totally secure in their profession, they, they're afraid they'll lose their job or they'll be ostracized. The, the social stigma for people who uh, associate themselves with the paranormal is strong. But when it comes to macro psychokinesis, which is one way of interpreting these phenomenon, it's, it's even much stronger. Well, earlier you referred to Franek Kluski, uh, a, a Polish medium who was researched very, very extensively. Let's, let's just talk about some of that uh, history. Franek Kluski was a Polish physical medium. He was highly educated. He was in the business world, a sophisticated person, and he had these abilities. They were sort of ran in the family. He had strange abilities as a child. And what's important about him is, well, first of all, there were a lot of materializations that took place in his seances that were very bizarre and not always pleasant to be around. And there were animals and all kinds of strange creatures. And it was often chaotic in his seance room. And uh, a lot of these sophisticated intelligentsia and scientists and philosophers and people from his country went and sat with him. But the, the most important element of his mediumship is the fact that two leading scientists of the day uh, Richet, Charles Richet and Gustave Joulet, they're both French. Richet was a Nobel Prize winner. They took uh, Franek Kluski into, we were talking about a lab, into a lab it, it, at, at an institute in Paris. And this was a room in which they had complete control. It had no windows. And they took him in and sat with him under tightly controlled conditions. And, and they, you know, that. They, there's somebody sitting on either side of the medium holding his legs and hands so they know he's not moving around the room. Uh, they had some light on in the room. They checked him to make sure he didn't bring anything in. I mean, all the standard things. They were astute investigators, and they knew how to have the strictest control so that fraud could be eliminated, completely eliminated as a possibility. And what these men did was they... they um, brought in a tub of, of hot wax, which was kept hot on, on top of a boiling, some boiling water. They asked these materializing forms in the room to dip their hands into the wax and to make a glove around their materialized hand. And then when the wax dried, the hand would dematerialize and drop this wax glove on, the, on a table or on the lap of a sitter. And this was their way of making a permanent record of these materialized hands. And uh, there were a series of 11 seances that they held in, they call it, seance is just the, the word that's used to describe a sitting with a physical medium. I don't really like the word, but that's what, that's what they use. So there were 11 of them at, these, at this lab in Paris. And they were, and so 
and you can also read descriptions of people in the room. Sometimes they could see the, the little lights forming around the hands and they could actually see them doing this. They could, they could hear the wax splashing, the wax would drip around the room. And um, then these hot, these things would drop on them. So then afterwards they could take these wax gloves, pour plaster in them and, and remove the wax. And then they would have this perfect replica of this materialized hand. And what's really interesting about them, Jeff, is that they're, if you look at these molds, you, there's no way that, it, first of all, the wax was so thin, paper thin, that a hand could not remove itself from that wax without destroying it. Uh, another really interesting factor is that sometimes they were interlocked like this. So you had two hands, so to imagine trying to slide a hand out when they're interlocked or you'd have them in positions with a finger pointing or something. Another really evidential component was that some of them were child size. So even though they had the features of, a, of an adult, like a, all the features of an adult hand, they were the size of a child, which is another sort of paranormal component of it that points towards the impossibility of, of some human being in the room having done it. And the scientists were very careful to control it, as I said, and they would sometimes slip dye into the... Uh, wax without telling anyone else in the room. There'd be a few other people in the room because it helps bring energy into the room, but they wouldn't tell anybody, including the medium, that they put that dye in there and then when the molds were made, they could compare it to the actual wax in the room. They measured everything. They measured the amount of wax that was there at the beginning versus the amount at the end and how much, how much, how many molds were made and how much did they weigh and, you know, very, very, very meticulous. And so, I, I just absolutely love these molds. I remember when I discovered them doing research, to me they were sort of like this most miraculous manifestation of this of the reality of materializations. And I used to stare at the photographs all the time and and they you know, there was a big thick book about them, long, long detailed descriptions of every single time one was one was made and how it was made. And um, then I would have the opportunity to go to Paris last fall where they're actually stored. They're locked in a vault in the dark, you know, in an, in, in this, at the in metaphysical Institute in Paris. Um, and the curator there was nice enough to bring them out and I was able to actually look at them and touch them. And that was a major moment for me. So they have this real, uh, kind of magical, mystical quality to me, but they're physical, they're real. So I, I, I think they're really important, and they're very, very important evidence, in my mind, for the reality of this. What surprises me is that uh, something as delicate as a, a paraffin glove could uh, sustain the plaster being poured into it. I've read about these uh, in the past, and I always assumed that the hand was dipped into like a bowl of paraffin, and then the bowl hardened, and then, then the hand dematerialized, and the plaster cast was made. Yeah, no, the hand would actually dematerialize inside the wax, but the wax would be cool, you know, and it was very thin, and I think they lost a lot of the gloves in the process. I mean, and there were a lot that were, you know, torn, and and I, I don't know exactly. I mean, I think they had a they probably very, very, very carefully poured it in there very, very slowly, and learned how to do it. And then they, when it hardened, they would scrape the wax away. But they were able to do it for enough of them that they're well preserved. You write about uh, Thomas Mann, the great German writer, attended some of these seances and wrote very eloquent de descriptions. And in fact, as I recall, he be he described himself as becoming seasick just watching the you know, paranormal phenomenon occurring. It was almost more than he could handle. That's right. I love. I put it in there partly because his descriptions were just so eloquent and, and beautifully written in the style of writing you don't see much anymore. But yeah, he described it as so shocking and disorienting that he did describe himself feeling seasick. And uh, he felt, you know, he was seeing something impossible. And it's shocking. And he was an intellectual. He didn't have never expected to witness any, any of this. So I think it does have a very big effect on people when they see it for the first time. In the context of spiritualism, the 
point of these materializations is is to provide proof of an afterlife. And yet, uh, you've explored this with our mutual friend Stephen Browdy, a very rigorous analytical philosopher who suggests that uh, the, the most extreme physical uh, manifestations do not necessarily prove that an afterlife exists. Absolutely. That is the big question, Jeff. I mean, I think we open-minded people who look at these scientific studies, and there's quite a few of them, Kluski being one, Eusebia being another, we can, we, can, we, we can agree that these things actually happen. The question is, how are they happening? Are they caused you know, exclusively by human beings, which is the argument that, that Stephen Browdy makes, or are they caused by the spirits in the afterlife manipulating the substance of ectoplasm, which we can talk about, and, and doing these, coming through and creating these living forms or moving things in the room and all the things that happen. And yeah, I had, a, I, you know, the, the mediums themselves believe, of course, their experience is that it is the spirit world. Now they're in trance throughout. That's another component with physical mediumship. Uh, I mean, Eusebia Palladino was maybe not always in a total trance, but somebody like Franek Kluski, were you having actual physical materializations? That medium is not even consciously there. So I think that um, it's, it's a very hard thing to nail down. I mean, there's an argument to be made on either side of it. I find it hard to comprehend after having witnessed it myself uh, and experienced a full form materialization more than once. And hearing the voice speak and you know, there's a whole process which I can talk about that goes on. I find it hard just sort of at some gut level to accept that this is just something that these human beings in this room are somehow able to do and it's just another form of PK, which is what Stephen will argue. From a rational standpoint, it makes sense. He'll say there's no difference between the materialization of a finger and the materialization of a full person. It's the same process. So, Philosophers make rational arguments, and I'm not sure this can be explained on a rational level, actually. Uh, there's so much involved with the experience of it, and I'm not to say that one becomes gullible, but um, there are just, you, know, you there's a lot of factors at play. So I don't think we have, you know, we can't prove it one way or the other. As an investigative journalist, you set out to see if you could witness this for yourself. Let, let's talk about that process. Uh, because for the most part, uh, these days, even in the parapsychological community, the, uh, the general uh, understanding is that physical mediums uh, aren't available anymore. You get you know, spoon benders and people who can do psychokinesis, uh, such as Ted Owens, about whom I wrote a book, uh, The PK Man. But physical mediumship was considered largely extinct. And, uh, you know, I think it still is. I think there's some truth to that, Jeff. There are also physical mediums, and there have been in the past, that that do commit fraud. And I think we, you know, I want people to understand that I'm not denying that. Uh, there was a reason that they were considered to be frauds because many of them were. And even today, and since I've been working on this, there have been questions of fraud with certain people. Uh, there's, there's sort of a tendency now for mediums to go to, uh, uh, you know, get trained. And then in a couple of years, they're out, you know, charging money for, for their work and all of this. It's a different climate than it was in, in in the earlier days, when people had the patience and time to sit week after week, year after year, and let things unfold gradually. It doesn't really happen anymore. So I, in my experience, I mean, I've looked around a lot. I've sat with various mediums. There's only one that I would really trust. To, and so there's some truth to the, the fact that it's a rarity. Um, and I was... I was fortunate enough to, I've spent five years sitting, studying, you know, and trying to understand the work of this one particular medium. But it isn't easy to find physical mediums that have been tested, that, that you know, are, are mature, that are fully developed. And 
that you can really trust. And I, there also may be more than we realize because of the stigma associated with this. There could very well, and I'm sure there are mediums practicing all over the world that nobody knows about. That's the other thing. Well, Stuart Alexander, with whom you worked, um, you have on your website, uh, I think our viewers will be interested in knowing, a couple of videos uh, in which he tells his life story. And he makes a point of saying that uh, even though he's worked with you and he has actually written a chapter in your book, Surviving Death, he doesn't uh, for most of his career, didn't want publicity, and even today keeps it to a, a real minimum. He's aware of the uh, terrible fate of other mediums uh, who who were in the public light uh, and uh, who were badly uh, mistreated as a result of it. That's right. He's very, very sensitive about that and very concerned that that's going to happen to him. And not so much now, but he's concerned about it after he's gone, about, you know, and, and the legacy that it leaves behind for his family. He's got grandchildren he's close to. So he, he's always been very, very private. And the fact that that video even exists on my website is like a miracle that he even allowed that. And he just wants to sit quietly week after week. And he's been doing this for 40 years, which is a long time. Well, one of the uh, things associated with his mediumship is the production of ectoplasm, which has has been uh, documented over and over again in different countries with different mediums for the last 150 years. You've had the opportunity to witness the production of ectoplasm. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so an ectoplasm, you know, is an actual substance. And as you've mentioned, it's been documented and it's been photographed uh, with, by various mediums. And uh, people can find out how to look at those photographs, but it always looks pretty weird in photographs, Jeff. But um, it is, it's, it's some kind of a, a substance that is emitted from the body of the medium. And um, it takes all, it allows, I'm going to give it from their perspective, from their perspective, it allows the spirit team, the spirit people working with them to use it to, to uh, materialize themselves or to make rods and move things around the room. Um, so, uh, and it's basically, it's got a physical component to it, but it's really an energy kind of a substance, but you can see it. It's, it's, nobody understands it, um, but I have seen it. And so have many, many other people uh, with Stuart Alexander. Um, and, one way that I, I mean, a lot of the seance is another factor. A lot of his work is done in the dark and people have a lot of questions about that. Oh, if it's in the dark, then you can cheat and blah, blah, blah. And we can discuss that too. But um, the, 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 the situation with ectoplasm that I've witnessed takes place with a light on it. So I, you know, I'm able, you can see a, a cloud of ectoplasm coming over this, this table that has light underneath it. And it just looks like a cloud, kind of a, almost like water, but it's not water. And then I've been able to witness it uh, form itself into a hand right before my eyes. Uh, and then I've been able to touch the hand and feel it, that it is a solid, physical, human hand. It bangs on the table to, make, to let us know it's physical. And then it withdraws and, and is, is gone. So... In that set, in that in that situation, I was able to witness the ectoplasm as just plain ectoplasm, and then actually watch it form into this physical hand that could move and, and move around. While that is happening, the spirit person whose hand it is is speaking through the medium and, and you know explaining what's going on and directing the sitter when to touch it and where to put you know how to how to operate while this is going on because ectoplasm is very sensitive. You don't want to make any mistakes or do anything that you shouldn't do, or it can be dangerous for the medium. It's a lot of complicated factors here, Jeff. One of the most fascinating aspects of all of this is, is that the uh, spirit uh, who produced a hand through the medium, Stuart Alexander, with whom you work, this spirit is referred to as Walter. 
And uh, the spirit Walter was also very well known in the 1920s as the deceased brother of the medium popularly known as Marjorie Minna Crandon, who was a uh, high society lady uh, who, who was also a uh, very, very famous medium in the, in the 1920s and, and produced all sorts of effects uh, ostensibly through uh, the agency of this very same spirit, Walter. And if, you know, if this is the same spirit who was producing phenomena a hundred years ago and is still doing it today, it, that would seem to be uh, evidential of uh, actual survival. It seems it to me, Jeff, but a skeptic could say, well, he says he's the same Walter, but how do we really know that? Skeptic can always argue. We don't have any proof that he's the same Walter Stinson. But, um, you know, it's interesting because Stuart was very, very interested in Marjorie Crannon because she was so severely misunderstood and, and you know, unfairly treated once Houdini came in and did his whole number on her. And there were some problems with some wax thumbprints and there were some things that her husband was involved in that weren't exactly above board, but she was an absolutely extraordinary medium and he was very, very interested in her and he studied and studied her. And that was when Walter Stinson came through. And the way he describes it is he was drawn to Stuart because of his interest in his sister, even though he had sworn that he would never, ever do this again because he felt he utterly failed the first time. He wanted to try again to see if he could remedy the situation that had happened before. So he's a very, very powerful presence in that in, in that room. And he is the one who is responsible for the physical materializations and the movement of objects. And you, you're astute enough to notice that, Jeff, because the, the irony is that Stuart is always very nervous about anybody even knowing that it's the same Walter because he's afraid that people will use that to discredit him. So he likes to, but it's in my book. It's in his book. It's out there for people who look. So there, there you go. But, um, yeah, he, he says he's the same Walter, and he's talked about situations from there. It seems like he knows what went on with his sister. And But as for the word proof, I wouldn't say it's proof. Because how can you prove it? Well, proof is a strong word, but I would say it's suggestive. It's very suggestive. Uh, I might also mention, for benefit of our viewers, that uh, I did interview uh, another author, David Jaher, who wrote a book called The Witch of Lime Street about the Marjorie mediumship. And I, I'm going to just put a link in the upper right-hand corner of the screen for viewers who want to know more about uh, the famous dispute between Marjorie the medium and Houdini the great magician, which was on the front page of newspapers across the United States back in the 1920s. It's a, a very interesting episode in the history of spiritualism. But uh, now to move on, let's let's talk more about uh, your experiences with Stuart Alexander. Okay, I'd like people to know, first of all, that I was very uh, careful when I first started having the opportunity to sit for the first two times with him, which I describe in my book, to do all my due diligence in terms of checking out the room and making sure everything, there were no ways, you know, no, no way anybody could come in or out during the sitting, checking the chair that he sits in, the table in front of him. Uh, he is strapped to his chair with cable ties. So I brought my own cable ties to make sure they weren't tricks. And I, I feel that I was extremely careful to make sure that everything in that room was tight and that there's no, there was nothing funny going on. Not that I expected it because he had been practicing for so long that I think that if he were a fraud, it would have been discovered by now. And he had been sat many times in other locations and, you know, all the things that you would want to know about somebody that you wanted to be able to trust all had happened with him. And it's a little boring to go on about it, but um, that's all in my book. So I, I had... After having a long email exchange with him, I had the opportunity to go over to England and sit twice with him in the spring of 2015. That was my first, uh, my first two experiences, and it was life-changing, put it mildly. Um, 
I don't know if you want me to talk about that or the overview. And then, you know, over the years since then, I have developed a very close relationship with the members of his circle and with him and we're colleagues. And I sort of become part of the circle. And uh, even in the last two years or so, I've been sitting remotely from New York through the computer and joining the seances every week that way. So uh, I am, I, it's a very big part of my life. And um, I don't know if you want to ask specific things about it. Of course, when you're remote, you can't experience the physical phenomena. But the physical aspect of it, Jeff, is just part of what, what I think what Stuart feels is the most evidential component, even more than Walter showing up again, is when people can communicate with their loved ones and information comes through for them that he couldn't possibly know, that no one in the room could possibly know. Uh, that's a component of what happens there that he feels is really, really important. So there's a lot of things that go on. That's more like mental mediumship, but there's one spirit person who's responsible for that component. And these, these spirit voices, they come in and out of his body when he's in trance. And they're like five of them, and I feel like I know them as people. And they have distinct personalities, distinct voices, and distinct roles that they play in the room. And the overall purpose is, of course, to show the people and to show the sitters that we survive death. And they all have their various ways of making that, making that point. I understand that the voices sometimes come you know, through his vocal apparatus. He's actually speaking and they're using his brain, his vocal cords, his nervous system. But sometimes the voices are actually coming from elsewhere in the room, like through these, uh, they look like megaphones and they're referred to as trumpets uh, that the, the spirits use. So his vocal cords are not always involved. That's right. And that is way more spectacular, as you can imagine, when that happens. There is one spirit guide uh, who almost always speaks only separately. And so his voice comes from a different part of the room, and it has a very different quality. And I've experienced that many times. Uh, and then another on another occasion, maybe once or twice, I did experience what you described, this um, thing they call a trumpet, which is like a cone with a or a megaphone, and this is the thing that levitates around the room. And sometimes while it's levitating, flying around the room, which is utterly joy wonderful to experience, it'll stop in midair and a voice will speak through it. And it is the most bizarre thing to experience that because it's it, the time I remember the, the most distinctly, it was right in front of me, you know, and Stuart is on the other side of the room and that voice is coming right from inside of there. And sometimes you can't quite hear what it's saying. Other times you might hear a couple of words. But it, it, it is like this very otherworldly, strange thing. So that these voices and it, it, yeah, I mean, that happens. It's called independent voice. And there have been mediums over the years. There are many mediums that are uh, facilitate that happening. But one called Leslie Flint, who was very famous for it. That's what's about all that he did was independent voice. Uh, and in the, it, with him, you could have extended conversations with your loved ones. So with Stuart, uh, this one spirit person who does that usually doesn't can't stay for too long, can't speak for too long, but he does come through it separately. And it's just a kind of a miraculous thing. The way he describes it is that he's creating a voice box out of the ectoplasm, that he uses the ectoplasm to somehow make the structure and they describe it as projecting sort of like they can project their thoughts somehow into it and create voices from that. And believe me, I have no idea how that, how that works, but they have some way of being able to do it. Yeah. And so that's um, pretty special when that happens. And I understand now you, you've witnessed the levitating megaphone. You've also witnessed uh, somehow Stuart Alexander's arms, even though they are uh, locked down using uh, some sort of plastic ties that are very strong, uh, his arms can easily be freed from the ties uh, at the direction of uh, the spirit Walter. Exactly. Walter calls it his matter through matter experiment. And what he, so Stewart's lock, he, he has a cable tie, which is around the thinnest part of his bare wrist. It's very, very tight. Now, when you see a medium that has a, a tie up here and they're wearing a thick sweater, 
you can imagine that maybe they could slide out. But with Stuart, it's, it's very much the thinnest part of his arm. and It's just impossible for him to slide out. And you can't remove that cable tie unless you have a, a wire cutter. So what happens is Walter ha and Walter asks us, this is in the dark, by the way, but you feel it all. You, you, the sitter will come and put their hand on top of that cable tie and, on, and feel that it's on Stuart's hand on top of the chair. Walter will say, now just uh, move your hand, you know, an inch to the right. And at that moment, he, Stuart's arm flies up into the air. And, and then the sitter, now he says, is that cable tie, tie still on the table? And you can feel that it's still there. Even though, and his arm has gone right through it. So, and then he will bring the hand arm back down and it's back in the cable tie. And then he will pull the cable tie through Stuart's arm and give it to a sitter as a gift. And I, I have probably three or four of those in my possession of those cable ties. And they're, those cable ties are all over the world for people who have taken them with such joy as a, as a, as a memento from that. But it, that's another amazing thing. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff, they need the dark in order to do it. And when Stuart began his development, he began it in the dark because he felt that would facilitate phenomena. And he, it would, he, when they started sitting, he just felt like it would be more likely to happen. And even the experimenters who have studied mediums in the light have acknowledged that phenomena do, are more powerful and more likely to occur with less light. It's just the way it seems to work, and it's especially true when you're working with ectoplasm. So the the matter the matter through matter experiment they've they've been able to put the light on, you know, a second after his hand has come through the tie, so people can see it, but not while it's going through. But you can hear a snap as it goes through, which um, Walter has said is not anything breaking in the. It's got something to do with the energy that the burst of energy that's taking place at that moment. It's not something physical within the cable tie. I took one of the cable ties. To, uh, I have a friend who was had it looked at in a, whatever the highest resolution mic microscope is for looking at physical materials, you know, to see the molecular structure. I just wanted to see if there was anything they could see. And there was absolutely no sign of anything having disturbed the structure of, of the cable tie. So I thought that was kind of interesting, and it was... I would have, it would have been great if there had been, but um, I've seen it happen. So have many other people. So anyway, you know, a lot of people are skeptical because they'll say, oh, magicians can do things like that. But I think if you're in the room and you see where that cable tie is on his arm and how tightly it is, it is locked. Uh, I, I think that anybody there would not be able to claim that this is something that is a trick. This is all very sensationalistic. It, it's uh, obviously it sounds unbelievable. Most people are going to probably say whether or not they believe it, they understand it's kind of unbelievable because it's so rare. But the interesting thing to me is that it's not done for the benefit of a performance. It's really, uh, these groups uh, have been working together sometimes for many, many years. And I understand from Stuart Alexander, it took him many, many years of sitting week after week after week with the same group of people to very, very slowly develop these abilities. That's right. He has incredible patience. And it was very slow. And for some of the mediums in history, that hasn't been the case. It's been a lot faster. And when Stewart started, he didn't think that he was a medium. He just was fascinated by it. And he wanted to sit with some friends. So they just sat for the enjoyment of sitting in the dark to kind of see if spirit would come through in some way. And, it, and then gradually things started to happen to him. And you're right. I mean, even like the, the experience I described of witnessing that hand materialize from ectoplasm, that took years of Walter working on it to be able to do it. So each step along the way took a long, long time. It's a very slow process requiring a lot of patience. And you're right. It's nothing about performance. Stuart went through a period where he was, he did what he calls public demonstrations, where he felt it wasn't fair that more people didn't get to see it. So he would do, I don't know, maybe once a week or something, you know, larger groups um, and, and people would be able to be guests and come and sit. There've been a lot of people who've been guest sitters over the years, but 
he really is interested in sitting quietly with his group and developing his mediumship because new things are always being developed. They're always working on what they call experiments, developing new abilities, testing new things. And um, that's what's meaningful about it. And now you've become a, a part of his group, I gather. I, I kind of have. I was so fascinated by it and, you know, wrote the book. And then I went back and sat more. I um, definitely now sit remotely, which is because whenever I can go over there, I do. I think the last time I was there was about a year ago. Um, and I would have been over there more recently if it hadn't been for the quarantine and virus and everything. But, um, and so we have a small group here in America that sit with him every week through the computer. And this is, this is an experiment that Walter has been absolutely ecstatic about. It, he, it's, he's absolutely thrilled to be able to play with having sitters at long distances and see if he can create phenomena in the space where we are. So that was very, that was developing. And then we, we've been uh, not able to sit for quite a while. But so, yes, it is something I'm very involved with, Jeff. And it's something I look forward to every week. But it's been months now since we've been able to, to get together. But there were some very interesting things that were happening uh, physically on this, you know, in this part of the world. And, of course, they say that time and space mean nothing to them. It doesn't make any difference. So um, it is a way that, that I can stay connected every week. Has it affected you personally? Has it changed you in any way? Oh, yeah, I would say expanded my perceptions tremendously. I mean, it's you're witnessing things that are supposed to be impossible over and over again. So it kind of, um, I feel that, you know, I'm, I'm way more accepting of, the power of consciousness, the fact that consciousness is not just something locked into our brains, um, because regardless of whether these phenomena are caused by human consciousness or spirits, it's a statement about what consciousness is capable of. And it, it gives me uh, a, a different perspective on the physical world, that it, there's so much more going on than the physical world, and also a connection to um, an afterlife, a much closer connection to believing in the possibility that when we die, we go on to, to live somewhere else. I sometimes have doubts still because I'm this sort of, I'm, I, I, I'm rational about everything. But in terms of my experience of five years of this, you know, it, it certainly makes me much more open, much more connected to that reality of, of survival and um, that's extremely valuable. And, you know, I've witnessed so many people too, getting these communications from loved ones where, where evidence is provided and how that moves them emotionally is so profound. It's such a valuable experience for people who are grieving, just like mental mediumship is to be able to walk into this space. And you really feel like you're in another world when you're in this room. Uh, and to feel that connection to people who have died, it's indescribable. On one instance, you write about being in the room. It was totally dark, I gather. But uh, during that session, a full-bodied materialization occurred. And I hope people are not off, turning off the interview at this point. <laughs> but um, this is... Unbelievable, uh, Jeff. So there's one spirit person who works with Stuart. His name is Dr. Barnett. He's the same one who speaks independently that I was describing earlier. Distinguished British was a, was a doctor when he was here on earth. And he is the one spirit person who materializes fully in the seance room. It doesn't happen that often, but um, I've experienced it maybe three or four times in all the years I've been there. Um, I've also, it's happened when I've been through the computer, but not in the room. It's happened with other people there. But, um, the last time I experienced that was in May of last year, uh, about a year ago. And 
you just, I, I, I wrote about it in my epilogue to Stuart's book. I tried to put into words what it's like to experience that. Um, but uh, what happens is um, they'll tell you that, it's, that this is going to happen. And the, you'll, you'll hear the, the, so there's, there's a luminous bands around the curtain. There's a, a cabinet that Stuart will go into only when this is going to happen. So it's an enclosed space. Normally he's not in that space. But when there's going to be a full body materialization, he goes in, he closes the curtains or the spirit people close the curtains. Because I forget how that works. But, but when, when Dr. Byron is coming out, you can see the curtains opening because they're, they're illuminated around the edges. And Stuart is still strapped in his chair. So, and you hear them, this flapping of the curtains and then he'll talk as he walks into the room. And sometimes you'll hear footsteps. He'll make the footsteps for you to hear. But the last time this happened, he came and stood right in front of me and put these very large, but two very large hands on top of my head. And he just like taps my head up and up and down like this. And it feels really strange. It's very kind of fast. And he's talking right in front of my face. The voice is there talking while he's touching my head. And he said something like, um, no, I think he's, I, I wish I had the quote with me. Something like, I just wanted you to know that um, I'm, a, I'm, in, I'm a physical person or something. I should have gotten the quote before we sat down, but he said something really profound about this was to show that he was in physical form, but he really spent a long time with his hands on my head. It was, and they, it's just, you, you know, to imagine that this person didn't exist a few minutes ago, that he takes this ectoplasm and somehow creates physical form and you can feel it. You can't see it. But you can feel it on top of your head and his hands touching you and he's talking to you. And then he goes back into the cabinet. There have been incidences in the past where he came out of the cabinet carrying a, a illuminated ball of ectoplasm. Other people have witnessed this where they could actually see his hands. So there have been a lot of spectacular things that have happened before I ever met Stuart. Um, and that's one of them when he would walk around the room carrying a ball of yeah, it is really, really, really hard to comprehend, and I don't blame people for having all kinds of thoughts about how, you know, whatever they might be thinking, but um, I can just assure you that this isn't a fake situation, and it really happens. Well, I know in the autobiography of Mrs. Gladys Osborne Leonard, who was one of the great mediums from the 1930s, and she describes uh, her uh, development that, that as, as she developed her own mediumship, she sat in circles like this for months at a time without anything happening. And then eventually, uh, there came a point where a full bodied materialization like this occurred and, and the spirit began dancing and you could hear the tapping of the feet and, uh, and so on. And, uh, but in your case, I think it's important for people to understand you're still working as an investigative journalist. You haven't lost your sense of objectivity. You're writing articles for the New York Times. That's true. I mean, I always keep that perspective. And while I'm having the experience, I allow myself to be completely immersed in that experience. But I, then afterwards, I've got tapes, I've got yeah, you know, every session with Stuart is taped, so I have all of it on audio tape. And yeah, you're right. I mean, I feel like I'm very objective about it, and I trust my ability to be that way. I'm not gullible, so maybe that helps. But the other point you're making about Gladys Osborne, I mean, there have been physical mediums throughout history that have way more uh, full body materializations than Stuart does, and they were some of these people even worked in the light. Somebody like Alec Harris, who's probably one of the greatest materialization mediums ever. Uh, people, countless people described witnessing the forms walking around. And you know, so Stewart's got great abilities, but compared to some of the giants of the past, it's, uh, you know, they did a lot more of this than he does. There's a lot of great books out there. By the way, there's a book on Kluski, which is, you know, wonderful to read. And books about all these physical mediums and great uh, scientific papers that have been written by people who have studied them. So it's all it's all there. 
You mentioned Charles Roche, who was a Nobel laureate, uh, witnessed full-bodied materializations. Sir William Crookes, who uh, was the president of the uh, British Royal Scientific Society, witnessed full-body materializations. Uh, the, there's a very extensive literature on this. Uh, well, Leslie, Kane, this has been a great pleasure to have this time with you, and I'm pleased to let our viewers know that we plan additional uh, interviews. Uh, you have a whole other book on UFOs, and uh, you're deeply involved in, in an ongoing exploration of life after death. So um, I'm excited about the possibility of uh, further conversations with you. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. I really like being on your show, and I love the work you do, so I'd be happy to come back anytime. Well, thank you for being with me, and for those of you viewing, thank you for being with us.